morning. Uh, uh, John has been, of course, to India and to TFR several times, and many of us know him well. So I'll just give a very short summary of his 50 plus year career. Uh, John had his PhD in 1971 from Cambridge and has been a staff scientist at CERN from 1973 to 2010. From 2010, he holds the Clark Maxwell Chair of Theoretical Physics at King's College London. Uh, he's been awarded the Maxwell Medal in 1982, the Dirac Prize in 2005, and elected as the Fellow of, to the Royal Society as well as the Institute of Physics. He was awarded the CBE, which is the British equivalent of the Padma Bhushan, in 2012. So when I opened uh, his Wikipedia page today to write some of this introduction, I noticed uh, there's a picture of him writing the standard model Lagrangian. And I just realized it's the very same picture that's on my tea mug here. So maybe many of you have seen this before. And it's very apt uh, because three of the terms on this refer to the Higgs. And John was one of the very first people to write down the production and decay modes of the Higgs boson back in 1975. And in the 1980s, he was also a pioneer in calculating how supersymmetric particles could be produced at colliders. Continues to be very hands-on with the data, uh, what, with what the data has to say with, about both the Higgs sector and SUSY. And he has authored over a thousand papers in cosmology and particle physics. And today he will tell us about the newest tool in the arsenal, how gravitational waves can be used to probe fundamental physics. Thanks, John, for agreeing to give the colloquium remotely. Uh, please uh, start whenever you're ready. Okay, well, thanks very much, Nishita, and I also thank uh, Rishi for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, brings back happy memories of when I uh, was able to visit Mumbai in person, and uh, I hope for those days we'll return again soon, and I'll be able to see you all uh, really instead of virtually. So, uh, Today I'd like to talk about uh, one of my current research interests, which is uh, the fundamental physics that you can do with gravitational waves. So, oops. So I thought I'd start off by uh, reviewing uh, the gravitational wave spectrum, uh, what sorts of signals we expect in gravitational waves from what types of sources. And uh, then I'll remind you about the gravitational wave story so far, which uh, includes uh, the LIGO and VIRGO experiments, uh, soon to be joined by uh, LIGO India. I also enter into the subject of uh, supermassive black holes. We, we know that uh, most galaxies, including our own, contain supermassive black holes. Uh, can we observe them using gravitational waves? And can we also look to see how they were constructed, presumably out of smaller uh, black holes or, or stellar systems? So I'm having a problem with my... Okay, another solution. Okay, so as I will discuss uh, observations of uh, black hole mergers, in particular massive black hole mergers, uh, are great tools for probing the propagation of gravitational waves, uh, which could give us, already has given us, but will give us in the future, strong constraints on the graviton mass and also on the possible violation of uh, Lorentz symmetry in gravitational physics. So that's the first fundamental physics topic that I'll touch upon. Uh, I'll also discuss the prospects for observing gravitational waves from first order phase transitions and gravitational waves from cosmic strings. So uh, cosmic strings excited a bit of interest towards the end of last year with uh, an observation by the uh, nanograv pulsar timing array, what might be a signal of gravitational waves from gravitational uh, from uh, cosmic strings. And I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. So gravitational waves, uh, you know, people often talk about world shaking discoveries, but, but gravitational waves really are a world shaking discovery. 
because they change the shape of the Earth uh, between elliptical, uh, circular, and elliptical in the opposite direction. And uh, when they do this, the Earth expands and contracts by more or less the diameter of an atomic nucleus. So here I have a, a very sophisticated animation showing this phenomenon. As you can see, the world literally shakes. So gravitational waves were uh, proposed by Einstein in uh, 1915. And he predicted gravitational waves in uh, 1916. So uh, here's a picture of uh, the uh, front page of uh, Einstein's first paper on the subject. It should be said that Einstein was a bit hesitant about his prediction of gravitational waves. He sort of oscillated backwards and forwards uh, in predicting them. In fact, in uh, 1936, he wrote a paper in which he argued that gravitational waves do not exist. I'm sorry, I'm having problems. Well, uh, so in, in 1936, he wrote a paper where he tried to retract his prediction. Uh, the paper was sent to a journal. The journal sent it to a referee. Einstein was shocked. Uh, so how could you possibly dare send a paper of mine to a referee? Uh, but the referee pointed out that actually his argument that there should not be gravitational waves is incorrect. And so Einstein eventually published a corrected version of the paper, uh, including the prediction of gravitational waves. So the first uh, direction, detection of gravitational waves was indirect. Uh, in 1974, Hulse and Taylor observed a binary pulsar system. And uh, as the two neutron stars go around each other, they emit gravitational waves. This changes the orbit. The change in the orbit has been observed over many years. And uh, here you see observations from the uh, Arecibo radio telescope that uh, tracked the system for decades. So those observations revealed perfect agreement with uh, Einstein's prediction. And uh, for that, uh, Hulse and Taylor got the Nobel Prize in 1993. Whoops. So I'm having trouble with my animations, okay. So unfortunately, the uh, Arecibo radio telescope is no more. Uh, as you may have heard uh, just a few months ago, it uh, collapsed. And you can find very dramatic uh, movies of the collapse on, uh, on YouTube. OK, so that was the first indirect detection of gravitational waves. The first attempts at direct detection were made using uh, metal bars. Uh, in particular by Joe Weber, whom you see here in the right-hand picture. Uh, I might mention also that there was a, another metal bar experiment hosted by CERN in uh, the 1980s. Uh, that was a cryogenic experiment called Explorer. But, but none of these experiments found any evidence for gravitational waves, and we now understand that their sensitivity was uh, you know, insufficient. So, so what do we actually expect? So uh, here I have uh, a panorama of the, uh, the frequency and the, uh, the, the typical uh, periodicity of uh, gravitational waves ranging from the age of the universe down to uh, milliseconds. You see a, a number of possible sources here. Let me draw your attention to uh, for example, astrophysical sources, I already mentioned uh, black holes, in particular massive black holes. Uh, I might also mention uh, compact objects being captured by supermassive black holes, uh, rotating neutron stars, maybe supernova explosions uh, could be observed if they're sufficiently asymmetric. Then of course we have uh, cosmological sources like, for example, quantum fluctuations in the early universe, 
which are observable as polarization effects in the cosmic microwave background radiation. So what, what techniques uh, do we have available to uh, look for gravitational waves? So uh, the initial direct discovery that I'll discuss in a moment was made using uh, laser interferometers, uh, LIGO and VIRGO. Uh, already planned are space versions of those laser interferometers. Now we'll be discussing later uh, a, a program to explore gravitational waves using atom interferometers, which I'm personally involved in. And as I already mentioned, uh, there's also the possibility of uh, detecting gravitational waves through their effects on pulsar timing. And I'll come back to that at the end of the talk. Anyway, put this all together, there's a vast array of interesting astronomical sources, cosmological sources, a whole new type of astronomy has been opened up by the direct detection of gravitational waves. So uh, just to remind you, uh, the initial discovery came from the LIGO experiment in the United States, which has uh, two locations. Uh, one is in the state of Washington on the left, and the other is in the state of Louisiana on the right. So uh, these two detectors consist of a, uh, an L-shaped uh, laser interferometer, whose principle I'll now remind you of. So uh, you start off with a laser source uh, indicated here by that little uh, purple star. Uh, sends off a laser beam, which is then split to go along the two arms of the L-shaped detector that you saw previously. Uh, there's a mirror at the end of the arm, which then bounces the laser beam back. And then you can compare the phases of the uh, laser beams coming back from the two arms. And you can look to see whether they are interfering constructively or destructively. And this can change when you have the passage of a gravitational wave. So in this picture here on the left, you see the two beams reinforcing each other. And over on the right, you have what happens when they cancel out uh, because of the effect, for example, the passage of a gravitational wave. So these are not uh, astronauts. Uh, these are actually uh, technicians uh, installing uh, the LIGO experiment. Uh, they're dressed like that in order to avoid uh, messing up the, uh, the mirrors and the other laser equipment. Uh, you don't want uh, dust and you no know, human fragments uh, messing up your mirrors. So uh, here's an illustration of, uh, again, of the Lego le uh, LIGO layout. Uh, the laser source is now on the left-hand side. Uh, you see uh, the mirrors, uh, which are labeled here as test masses, which reflect the light backwards and forwards. In fact, they use many passages forwards and backwards along the two arms uh, to build up the uh, interference effect. And uh, eventually you have a photo detector at the uh, bottom there. So on the right hand side, you can see uh, the initial sensitivities of the two LIGO detectors, uh, one in uh, Louisiana and the one in Hanford, Washington. And you see that they're sensitive to uh, a strain, so that's a distortion of uh, space time at the level of 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 23, over a range of frequencies, uh, typically above a few tens of hertz and extending up to something like a thousand hertz. I remind you that what they're looking for is an effect of the change in the Earth's diameter by the size of an atomic nucleus. So obviously the effect on any individual laser arm is, is much, much smaller than that. Anyway, uh, they observed similar signals in uh, the two detectors. So we've got uh, LIGO Livingston on the left, LIGO Hanford on the right. And uh, these are the signals that they observed from the uh, first merger of a pair of black holes. So in the top, you see the raw signal. And in the bottom, if you can just uh, make it out, you can see the waveform predicted from models of the infall uh, merger and ring down 
of a pair of black holes. And what you can see is there is perfect agreement with the predictions based on Einstein's general theory of relativity. So the interpretation of that first event was the uh, fusion of two massive black holes, each of them weighing approximately 30 solar masses. And one of the statistics that I find most incredible about that event is that the amount of energy radiated in the form of gravitational waves was approximately equivalent to three solar masses. So three suns radiated in gravitational waves. So uh, as I already alluded to, there are several different stages in the uh, fusion of two massive uh, black holes. You have an initial in-spiral phase, followed by a subsequent merger phase, and then eventually a ring down, because it, when, you, when the merger first happens, you get a sort of dumbbell-like structure, which then radiates more gravitational waves until it eventually becomes an essentially spherical structure. So during the in-spiral uh, in phase, the uh, frequency of the uh, gravitational wave emission gradually increases. And in parallel, the velocities of the neutron of the uh, black holes as they rotate around each other during the final stages of the merger approach something like a half the speed of light. Okay. Which is pretty remarkable. I mean, we talk about large hadron colliders, but this is a really big hadron collider. So uh, as I already commented, Einstein was right the first time when he initially predicted the existing existence of gravitational waves. And as I've been discussing, and I'll now go into in more detail, uh, they provide us with a new way of studying the universe. So the frequency of the gravitational waveform uh, increases uh, as you get closer to the actual merger. This is the so-called gravitational chirp. And uh, here you see the uh, chirps that were heard around the world by the uh, two LIGO detectors. So you see the frequency indeed increases uh, during the in-spiral. And at the end, you have a, a bright spot where you have the ring down of the newborn black hole. So the LIGO collaboration already used those initial observations to constrain the possible mass of the graviton. And uh, they show they showed that it could be at most 10 to the minus 27 of the mass of the electron. The fact that you have uh, gravitational waves of varying frequency and the fact that the waveform that we observe agrees with that predicted by general relativity tells us that the waves of different frequencies have essentially the same speed. And uh, that enabled us already back in 2016 to set the first constraints on Lorentz violation uh, by observations of gravitational waves. And I will discuss in a moment the prospects for improving those constraints in the future. So following that uh, first observation, uh, LIGO and Virgo observed several other gravitational wave events, as you can see in this picture. Most of them are due to the mergers of gravitational uh, of black holes, but the one in the bottom right-hand corner was rather special. Uh, that was due to the merger of two neutron stars. And uh, what's interesting here, as you can see, was that the duration of the signal observed was over tens of seconds rather than the fractions of seconds, which are typical for black hole mergers. What was also interesting about this binary neutron star merger is that uh, several experiments observed an apparent uh, electromagnetic counterpart. So in the top left, you see uh, the signals observed by the Fermi and integral uh, experiments, which observed uh, a peak in electromagnetic radiation 
which almost coincided with the merger. That's sort of expected when you, to, when you merge two neutron stars. You don't expect an electromagnetic flash to come immediately, but a little bit later in the evolution of the neutron star system. Uh, the bottom there, you see uh, the chirp that was observed. Uh, this is just the last part of the chirp extending over the last 10 seconds. So following these ob observations, something like uh, 70 astronomical groups around the planet made many follow-up observations of the uh, remnant of the neutron star merger. And uh, they confirmed many theories uh, about the formation of uh, massive elements uh, during those neutron star mergers. Uh, but that's a whole other story that I won't go into in great detail. So here is a, an illustration of the uh, masses of the black holes observed by LIGO and Virgo to have merged. So they range up to masses around 80 solar masses and uh, down to masses of the order of a few, less than 10. What you see below the blue in purple are black holes whose existence has been infirmed inferred by X-ray observations of binary systems uh, in our own galaxy. And uh, those reveal uh, the existence of black holes weighing up to 20 uh, solar masses. The bottom, you see neutron stars. So models of the neutron star equation of state suggest that their maximum mass is around twice that of the sun. And you can see at the bottom that two mergers of neutron stars in, in that mass range have now been observed. Also observed have been candidates for mergers of neutron stars with black holes. And uh, this you can see uh, in the middle of this picture here. So what's very interesting are these heavier uh, black holes uh, in particular, because there's a range of masses where astrophysicists did not expect astrophysical black holes to form, uh, although they might have been formed by some sort of a primordial mechanism, uh, which maybe I'll come back to later on. So as I mentioned, uh, the first uh, gravitational wave detectors to operate were uh, LIGO and Virgo. Uh, they've now been joined by the Kagura detector in Japan. And in the near future, we'll be very glad to see LIGO India uh, adding to the set of uh, laser interferometer detectors on Earth. So now I want to move on to uh, supermassive black holes. So as I already mentioned, uh, most galaxies contain supermassive black holes. Our own galaxy contains one, although it's relatively small uh, by the standards of these objects. It only weighs a few million solar masses. Uh, there was a very striking image uh, published uh, a couple of years ago of uh, the black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy which is a real supermassive black hole, weighing something like six and a half billion solar masses. So how will we in the future be able to observe phenomena involving such supermassive black holes? So the planned future step is a, a number of atom, inter sorry, uh, uh, laser interferometers in space. Uh, one which is going to be built by the European Space Agency in collaboration with NASA called LISA. And you see here an illustration. And there are also a couple of Chinese projects aiming to put laser interferometers in space. So here I come back to the gravitational wave spectrum and I situate LISA and LIGO and similar detectors 
on the frequency spectrum. So uh, laser is sitting in the middle, uh, most, sen most sensitive in a frequency range between let's say 10 to the minus two Hertz and 10 to the minus four Hertz. Uh, over on the right, we have the sensitivity range of the LIGO Virgo detectors of the order of uh, let's say 10 to a thousand Hertz. And over on the far left, we have the frequency range to which uh, pulsar timing arrays are sensitive, which is typically 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine Hertz. So LISA in the center there will be able to observe massive binaries of the sorts that might occur uh, with supermassive black holes. What we see though, uh, is a gap in the spectrum between that covered by LISA in blue and LIGO, etc., in red and purple. And uh, this gap in the spectrum is particularly interesting because that may reveal how supermassive black holes are formed, how we move up from the relatively small LIGO Virgo class black holes to uh, those supermassive black holes. In the centers of galaxies. Observations in this frequency range are also interesting for probing primordial cosmological processes. And I'll mention in particular the possibility of a phase transition in the very early universe and the possible existence of cosmic strings. It's worth noting that there's also a, a gap uh, in frequency coverage between LISA and the pulsar timing arrays, although I won't say very much about this talk, I'm going to focus on the possibilities for covering that gap between uh, LIGO Virgo and LISA. In particular, I'm going to be talking about atom interferometers. So I'm a member of a collaboration in the UK called AON, which is uh, planning to build a series of atom interferometers. And uh, we plan to collaborate with the MAGIS experiment in the United States, which is already constructing an atom interferometer uh, at Fermilab. So, so what is an atom interferometer? So what you have is uh, a couple of clouds of, uh, of atoms, you have a laser which can excite uh, those atoms. So the excitation is indicated here by the red dashed line. So we, these laser pulses uh, divide, redirect, and uh, then reconvert uh, the atomic de Broglie waves. And you can observe the interference between those atomic de Broglie waves. And because they have a much higher frequency than the uh, laser uh, beams, you get sensitivity to a different frequency range. And those interference patterns are sensitive to the modulation of the light travel time across the pair of interferometers, uh, which is caused by the passage of a gravitational wave. You can also look at other types of fundamental physics. Uh, for example, you can look for ultralight dark matter using atom interferometers, but I'm going to focus here on what you can do in the area of gravitational waves and fundamental physics. So what we're proposing with Aeon is a uh, staged program, starting off with a uh, 10 meter interferometer device to be followed, we hope, by a 100 meter device, eventually moving on to a one kilometer device, which would be sort of the maximum that you could do in terms of a terrestrial uh, atom interferometer. But eventually, we would like to go into space and build, if you like, an atomic analog of the laser, laser interferometer at this time. A, uh, an atom interferometer in space that we call EDGE. 
So the initial phase of uh, Aon 10, uh, we already got uh, initial funding and uh, work on this project started at the beginning of this month. So uh, our Aon 10 meter device is planned to be installed in the basement of the Oxford Physics Department. They've got a fancy new building, purpose built, low vibration, temperature control, a laser laboratory, strong engineering support. And uh, here is a, uh, a drawing of how the uh, Aon 10 meter device would fit within the stairwell in the Oxford Physics Department. So the 10 meter device will not be able to look for gravitational waves, but the subsequent stages, 100 meters, one kilometer, and the space version of Aeon would be able to look for gravitational waves, and they would be sensitive in that intermediate frequency range in between the sensitivities of LISA and LIGO Virgo. So there's various different types of fundamental physics that you can do with such a detector. And let me just uh, mention some of them. So I was talking earlier on about supermassive black holes, which uh, as you can see here, typically weigh maybe a, a billion solar masses. So how are they formed? Well, presumably through the mergers of lower mass objects. Now there's a lot of discussion amongst astronomers as to what objects uh, those are. Uh, maybe you start off with first generation population three stars, which form massive black holes, which then merge in a sort of hierarchical manner to form a supermassive black hole. Or maybe you merge smaller galaxies to make a bigger galaxy. The smaller galaxies contain smaller black holes and they merge to form larger, larger black holes. Either way, you might expect that there will be some leftover intermediate black holes with masses somewhere between the LIGO-Virgo range of less than 100 solar masses and the supermassive range above a million solar masses. So uh, here's a picture of some calculations uh, done a few, a few years ago by uh, Kamiankowski and collaborators where they calculate the uh, rate of uh, mergers of black holes weighing more than 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 solar masses uh, as a function of redshift. And uh, what you can see here is that, uh, for example, you might expect over 100 events per year of mergers of black holes weighing uh, 1,000 solar masses out to a redshift, something like 10. So here's what you can do for measuring those gravitational waves in various different experiments. So uh, over on the right here, uh, we have LIGO, which has observed the mergers of black holes weighing around 60 solar masses. On the left, we have LISA, which can observe the mergers of black holes weighing perhaps a million solar masses. So uh, what you see here are the characteristic strains coming from such mergers, uh, which over time, uh, the frequency evolves as I discussed uh, earlier on, and eventually you have the final merger and uh, ring down stages. So as I mentioned previously, there's a gap between the frequencies where LISO is most sensitive and those where LIGO is most sensitive. And that's where atom interferometers would come in. Uh, they would be ideal for observing, for example, the mergers of uh, black holes weighing of the order of 10 to the four solar masses, 10 to the five, 10 to the three, in that intermediate range between LIGO class black holes and LISA class black holes. I note also that you could, in principle, observe these mergers uh, over not just a few seconds, as you've seen in the LIGO experiment, but potentially hours, days, months, even years. 
so you can make very precise measurements of the infall over a long period of time. You can probe the formation of supermassive black holes. And by combining different experiments, you acquire synergies which enable you to make very precise tests of general relativity. So uh, I mentioned the space version of Aeon, which is the experiment that we call uh, EDGE. And I've given you uh, references where you can read up about EDGE and also about Aeon. So here are the sensitivities of LISA, EDGE, and a typical next generation uh, laser interferometer in the uh, 10 or so uh, hertz range called uh, ET. There's a similar, that's a project in Europe. There's a similar project in the US called Cosmic Explorer. So what you see is that uh, EDGE just nicely fills in a gap between ET and LISA and can probe possibility of mergers back to even redshifts of a thousand, uh, long before where we actually think that stop, such mergers would have started, unless, unless uh, there was some source of primordial black holes back in the very early universe. So Aeon and Edge are complementary to LIGO and the Einstein telescope. What's interesting is that uh, often you find complementarity between the stages of the merger, which you can observe with uh, different experiments. So in this picture here, the darker shading corresponds to me measurements of the actual final stages of merger, and the lighter shading corresponds to measurements of the in spiral. So you might be able to combine, for example, measurements of the in-spiral with aeon or edge and observations of the uh, final stage uh, with uh, ET. So these measurements can be used to improve the current constraints on the graviton mass. So this is uh, what you get uh, from compilation of uh, LIGO and uh, VIRGO measurements. Uh, an upper limit on the uh, mass of the graviton of the order of 10 to the minus 23 electron volts. Now, in the future, it would be possible to make observations over a longer period of time, uh, in particular by combining Aeon or EDGE with uh, LIGO or VIGO detectors. And those observations over a longer period of time enable, to, enable you to measure the infall process much more precisely. So in the bottom panel here, I show you uh, how you could in principle make measurements over not just seconds, not just hours, but potentially days. You can also hope to measure the mergers of uh, heavier black holes uh, weighing potentially hundreds of solar masses and not just tens of solar masses. And this is something that I explored in the paper with the Villa Vaskinen uh, about a year ago. And with that, we showed that uh, with for example, a one kilometer version of Aeon, you should be able to improve the current limit on the graviton mass by an order of magnitude down to the 10 to the minus 24 electron volts. And if there are indeed mergers of heavier black holes, 100, 200 solar masses, then you should be able to improve the limit down to something like 2 times 10 to the minus 25 electron volts. And with the EDGE space experiment, you should be able to improve the uh, upper limit, or I should say the sensitivity to the gravity no mass by another order of magnitude. So, these experiments offer the possibility of improving the current LIGO-VIRGO uh, limit on the gravitino mass by perhaps three orders of magnitude. You can also use these gravitational wave measurements to look for a possible modification in the dispersion relation of gravitational waves. 
So what we expect is that uh, for gravitational wave, B is equal to P. The energy should be equal to the momentum. But there are models of Lorentz violation that suggest that that might be modified by some additional term, which is some power of P denoted by alpha. And uh, here is a picture taken from our paper where we uh, compare the sensitivities of A on one kilometer in purple to edge in blue, to sensitivity of uh, LIGO, illustrated by the uh, diamonds and the triangles, and also uh, cosmic rays. So uh, A on one kilometer is potentially sensitive to uh, has a potential sensitivity 10 times better than LIGO or Virgo for the uh, parameter alpha equal to one half. And edge would have a sensitivity which would be a thousand times greater than that of LIGO and Virgo for this particular value alpha equal to one half. So, uh, these atomic uh, interferometer experiments have the potential to make very precise probes of possible Lorentz violation in gravitational waves. So let me now talk about the potential for exploring extensions of the standard model. Here I have an illustration from a simulation by uh, David Weir of collisions of bubbles of new vacuum, as might occur when you have a first order phase transition in the early universe. So such a phase transition proceeds by percolation of bubbles of the new vacuum. When the bubbles grow and collide, they can source gravitational waves, either directly from the bubble collisions or from turbulence and sound waves in the plasma made after uh, the phase transition takes place. So we looked at a couple of possible models of new physics that might give you such uh, first order phase transitions. Uh, one is where you just add to the standard model an h to the sixth of a lambda squared interaction. Uh, this is a sort of effective interaction of the type that's often studied when people are doing tests of the standard model at the LHC. And another model that we looked at was where you augment the standard model with an additional U1 prime uh, gauge boson. So of course, uh, these uh, modifications of the standard model also have prospective uh, collider signatures, but it's interesting to compare the sensitivity that you would get from gravitational wave measurements with those that you get from colliders. So here is an illustration for a first order phase transition generated by an H to the sixth uh, interaction. So here we see sensitivities of the LIGO experiment, the LIGO, so sorry, LISA experiment, the LIGO experiment, and possible atom interferometers in between. And we see here a bunch of illustrations of the gravitational wave signal that we would expect from an h to the sixth over lambda squared interaction for these particular values of, of lambda. And it's worth noting that the sensitivities of the LISA and EDGE experiments are, are very similar. Here's an example of the possible sensitivity to phase transition if you have an additional U1 prime gauge boson. Uh, so there are various different contributions to the gravitational wave signal, as I already mentioned, bubble collisions, sound waves, turbulence. And uh, here we chose particular parameters. Here's the U1 prime gauge boson is chosen to weigh 100 TeV. Uh, and you can see that it produces a nice signal sitting right in the middle of sensitivity of atom interferometer experiments. So this is indicative that these experiments would have an interesting sensitivity to 
particle physics beyond the standard model, which actually might also be beyond the reach of possible colliders. To finish, I want to talk about the possibilities for probing the existence of cosmic strings. And in particular, I want to discuss the possible hint for cosmic strings provided by the recent nanograv pulsar timing array. So when you have cosmic strings, you have a network of them uh, covering the Earth in a sort of uh, very loose uh, framework. As those strings move around, they can cross each other. And when they cross each other, uh, they form string loops. Those string loops then emit gravitational radiation as they collapse. And uh, here is a picture uh, from the Cambridge Cosmology Group of uh, a simulation of cosmic string network. And you can see in red there, those little loops of string, which are the prime sources of gravitational waves uh, that would come from such a cosmic string network. So uh, here are uh, examples of the possible uh, spectra of such gravitational waves. So they're characterized by Newton constant, G, and by mu, which is uh, the string tension. So that's a measure of the scale at which these strings appear. So the spectrum is approximately flat, not completely. There's a turnover at uh, very low frequencies and at higher frequencies, you can see the effect of changes in the number of degrees of freedom. So what's shown here is what happens when you switch on the degrees of freedom in the standard model uh, as the universe evolves. Uh, in principle, you're also sensitive to uh, more dramatic changes if there are additional changes in the number of effective degrees of freedom, uh, for example, if there's a hidden sector. So currently the uh, best constraint on the uh, tension G mu of cosmic strings is provided by pulsar timing arrays and it's of the order of 10 to the minus 11. So in the future, uh, there are a number of experiments that will probe uh, the string tension down to smaller values. So one is uh, a square kilometer array. So an array of radio telescopes that's over there on the left that should be starting operation on a small scale relatively soon. Uh, Aeon one kilometer, uh, here we put in a possible startup date of uh, 2030. Uh, that would be very interesting. Uh, as you can see, it could get a very interesting signal to noise ratio, uh, depending on the uh, tension on the strings. And uh, we would hope that uh, eight on one kilometer would come into operation before LISA. Of course, LISA would also have very interesting sensitivity to such cosmic strings. So what have we uh, learned recently from pulsar timing arrays? So the nanograv pulsar timing array has been observing up to 47 pulsars over a period of 12.5 years. And uh, back in September, they uh, announced their results. Perhaps I should have mentioned this uh, background here is an artist's impression of the effect that you're looking for. But the point is that as gravitational waves pass by the pulsars and through space, they upset the very regular uh, pulses emitted by those pulsars. And by looking statistically at those uh, pulsar timing signals, you can establish constraints or possibly observe fluctuations in space time generated by the passage of gravitational waves. So here's some results from the uh, nanograv 12.5 year. Uh, data set. So on the left, you see uh, the signal that they report. So they 
observe effects with a characteristic uh, frequency of about 10 to the minus eight Hertz. So at higher frequencies, they're basically uh, dominated by noise, but at lower frequencies, they think they see a signal which cannot be explained by noise. And they interpret this as strong evidence for a stochastic process at frequencies below 10 to the minus eight Hertz. So over on the right is a plot of uh, the amplitude on the vertical axis and the uh, power law uh, spectrum, uh, gamma. So the vertical dashed line here corresponds to what you would have expected if the PTA signal was due to the mergers of supermassive black holes. So it predicts that this parameter gamma should be four and one third. So the data from the nanograph pulsar timing array as shown here, those are probably consistent with the uh, prediction for mergers of supermassive black holes, but there's a tendency for the data to prefer a somewhat higher value of the uh, spectral slope. So uh, over on the left here, I have a few more details of the uh, nanograph observations. Uh, you draw your attention <clears throat> to the blue curves here marked HD. That is the uh, predicted shape as a function of uh, angle of the uh, cross-correlated power that you would see from looking at uh, different pulsars. So this blue curve is a characteristic prediction of gravitational waves. If there was just monopole emission of, of something that would give you this horizontal uh, dotted line here. It's too early to say whether the data prefer the gravitational wave signal over the other. This is another illustration of the uh, reconstruction of uh, interpulsar angular correlations compared with gravitational wave predictions. And well, you know, maybe there's a hint in favor of the gravitational wave origin, but as I said, I think it's too early to say. So together with uh, Marek Levitsky uh, towards the end of last year, we did an analysis of what you might expect from cosmic strings. Now, the interesting thing from cosmic strings is that you get a correlation between the power spectrum parameter gamma and the amplitude parameter A. So this is what it looks like. So this vertical line here, that corresponds to the prediction for mergers of supermassive black holes with this characteristic value of gamma of four and one third. Here we see the nanograv data, maybe a tendency to prefer a higher uh, value of the spectrum parameter. And as you can see, our cosmic string prediction is totally consistent with what nanograv is seeing. So, so what would the nanograv data correspond to? They would correspond to uh, cosmic strings with a uh, tension of 10 to the minus 10 or a few times 10 to the minus 11, uh, very close to the upper limits that had been set uh, previously, but uh, compatible with the previous data. So those are some examples of the fundamental physics that you can do with uh, present and future observations of gravitational waves. Uh, there are other probes of fundamental physics that you can do with uh, atom interferometers. Uh, you can use them to search for ultralight dark matter. Uh, you can use them to make high precision measurements of gravitational redshift. You can probe Bell inequalities, uh, equivalence principle, uh, you can look to see whether fundamental constants really are constant or not. Uh, there are also ways of probing dark energy. You can look for fundamental as opposed to environmental decoherence in quantum phenomena and so on. 
So atomic interferometers are potentially interesting for fundamental physics beyond the applications to gravitational waves that I've talked about. So to finish off, I would just like to show this cartoon. One bird says to another bird, was that you I heard chirp just now, or was it two black holes colliding? Thank you. Thank you very much, John. It was a great talk. So we can take questions now. So if anyone has questions, please raise your hand in participant window. And then I will ask you to unmute your mic and ask the question. Okay, Parnab Ghosh, please go ahead and ask your question. Can you explain how Lisa can distinguish between binary formation from primordial black holes and the formation and that form stellar origin formation channels? <clears throat> okay, so uh, the sort of astrophysical models that were proposed uh, before uh, the ligo vigo observations suggested that you would have a binary system in which the uh, spins of the two black holes were uh, positively aligned. Now, observationally, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, it's not to say that they're always opposite aligned. People have argued that actually there may be a combination of populations of pairs of black holes with aligned spins and with non-aligned spins. Now, people subsequently have got a bit more sophisticated about what the spins of those black holes might look like. And there are astrophysical models which propose that the spins would not be correlated. Uh, for example, if you have black holes which are in some accretion disk where there's a lot of dynamical phenomena taking place, maybe you get a merger between two black holes that initially did not form as part of a binary. The other possibility, which has excited many of my theoretical colleagues, is that you might have had primordial black holes that were formed as a result of uh, density perturbations, strong density perturbations in the very early universe, you know, much before the release of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So that would require uh, perturbations which are much larger than what has observed, been observed in the CMB. And uh, so you have to do a little bit of modeling gymnastics to uh, predict a, a lot of primordial black holes, but, but people have done that. So already people are analyzing uh, LIGO Virgo data to see what is the correlation uh, between the black hole spins as I already mentioned. Clearly, uh, LISA could carry that to a much more sophisticated level. I mean, there are details in the waveform which would differ depending on what is the relative orientation of the black hole spins. And uh, very naively, not having thought about it very much, I would kind of expect that if you saw some uh, supermassive black hole merger, for example, from the merger of two galaxies, a priori, I would not expect the spins to be strongly correlated. Uh, but let's wait and see. Maybe I, uh, okay, yeah, Girish Kulkarni. Uh, yes, so thanks for the very nice talk. I was wondering uh, regarding this uh, detection of intermediate mass black holes, uh, is uh, the redshift information necessary? And if it is, how would one might obtain it? Okay, well, you, in principle, you can get redshift information in, in two ways. What one is just from uh, measuring the uh, amplitude of the uh, gravitational wave signal. The point being that these uh, gravitational wave uh, sources, black hole mergers, neutron star mergers, act like uh, stands and sirens. Uh, once you know what the masses are of the black holes, you know not just what the frequency spectrum is, but also what the amplitude is. And then you can compare that with what you actually observe, and the comparison tells you 
roughly speaking, what the redshift is. That's one way of doing it. The other way, of course, is uh, if you have a merger that takes place uh, in a, uh, an object which emits uh, electromagnetic radiation, uh, you may be able to determine the redshift. Uh, that, for example, was the case of the uh, neutron star merger that I mentioned earlier on. Thanks. Okay, maybe I can ask one question. So John, can you explain a little bit about how this at atom interferometer works? In particular, what determines what frequency of gravitational waves uh, you are sensitive to? Well, I think that to give a, a lengthy explanation would be sort of difficult. Uh, I, I should perhaps have, have clarified that actually you have a pair of, ant of atom interferometers acting in parallel. Uh, the reason why you do that is that that way you can eliminate sources of common noise. And then you look at the, uh, the difference between the two atom interferometers in order to see whether there was a gravitational wave or an ultralight uh, dark matter signal. But the frequency is uh, depending on a number of parameters. I mean, I mentioned the atomic uh, de Broglie wave and so on. What you actually observe is a uh, displacement of uh, the cloud of, of atoms, uh, which builds up a characteristic interference pattern. Yeah, but you, uh, you mentioned that uh, this small interferos, interferometer is not sensitive to these gravitational waves. You have to have 100 meter or bigger interferometer. Is the size correlated with what frequency you are sensitive to? Is the bigger interferometer more sensitive to lower frequencies or there's no correlation there. Uh, so there's not a, a strong correlation, but if you have a, uh, a longer device, then you can compare the, uh, the atom clouds over larger distances, and that gives you greater sensitivity to the possible gravitational wave effects or ultralight dark matter effect. Okay, thanks. I don't see another question. So maybe I can ask one more question. So in uh, this atom interferometer, so you are shooting atoms from one end and then this cloud of atoms is going through the interferometer toward the other end or something else is happening? So, so you have basically a, uh, a fountain of, of atoms, which is uh, sending atoms up and then they, they fall back down again. And uh, during the propagation of the atoms, uh, they are excited by lasers, excited and de-excited uh, by lasers. Uh, and uh, you then look for an interference uh, pattern uh, in the uh, propagation of the atoms, essentially. So these are the electronic excitations of the atoms? You are exciting the electrons in the atoms? Or? Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. So specifically, you use uh, strontium atoms and there's a specific uh, excitation level, uh, which you use uh, lasers to stimulate. Okay, thanks. Uh, does anyone else has a question? Okay, no one else is raising hand. Maybe I, I can ask one more question. So in the cosmic strings, so cosmic strings come in various varieties. So the constraints that you were showing, they were for, for some very simplest form of cosmic strings. Because you we can have superconducting cosmic strings and other kinds of strings. And so different types of cosmic strings, depending on what is the microphysics, the right. gravitational wave output can be different. Right. Uh, and uh, so several other groups, uh, uh, after our paper published uh, other interpretations of uh, the nanograv data in terms of different models of cosmic strings. Uh, so I mentioned in particular uh, papers by uh, Kai Schmitz and collaborators and uh, Wilfried Buchmüller and collaborators. So, so, so people have considered uh, other uh, models of strings. As you say, we basically uh, chose uh, the plain vanilla model. 
I should mention that other interpretations have been given in terms of, uh, of black hole mergers. Um, is there an interpretation that is not related to gravitational waves, but maybe some other systematic or instrumental effect? So, so I, I haven't heard of another, well, I should, I should uh, be careful. I don't remember having heard of another interpretation, but, but maybe there is one that I've, uh, that I've forgotten about. Uh, the good news is that uh, there are several different groups uh, monitoring uh, pulsar timing arrays, and uh, they have comparable sensitivity to nanograv, and there is a, a project to uh, combine all their data uh, in an international uh, pulsar timing array uh, experiment. And I think they're very close to producing results. So uh, we may get uh, confirmation or not of the uh, nanograph signal relatively soon. And uh, I think the two things to watch out for in that are uh, the value of the uh, spectral index as parameter gamma that I mentioned, and uh, also whether or not they uh, observe this characteristic angular correlation. Uh, in my plots, there were these uh, blue dashed lines labeled HD for headings and downs. Uh, it'd be interesting to see whether that characteristic prediction of gravitational waves is confirmed. And if so, that would uh, rule out any alternative interpretation. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, okay, so we have uh, time if anyone has any other question you can ask now. Okay, it seems there are no more questions. So let's thank John again. Maybe everyone can mute, unmute their phone and clap. Thank you, John, for a wonderful talk. Okay. I hope well, to see you again in India once the uh, pandemic is over. Okay, well, thank you again for the invitation. And I hope that uh, the next time I talk about the subject, uh, we'll be able to show some uh, results from our Aeon 10 experiment. Yeah, that would be nice. Even if we can't show any gravitational waves. <laughs> okay, stay well. Thank you, John. So 